In this episode with my guest and good friend, Sohail Shatur, we talk about how Sohail's childhood led him to become an entrepreneur. We talk about the best way to get started making money online, either full-time or as a side hustle. We talk about the two types of people who get into copywriting. We go over how to pick business partners and employees. Sohail got burned by doing this wrong more than once, so we talk about how to do it right. And I talk about why I was introduced to Sohail as Menopause Boy. My name is Henry Bingaman. This is Getting Out of the Machine. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Getting Out of the Machine. Today is a special episode with uh, one of my copywriting protégés, Sohail Shatur. Sohail, thank you so much for coming on today. Oh, my pleasure. Thanks for having me, Henry. So uh, I want to hear a little bit about your life story because uh, I started working with you, I think, when you were 24. How old are you now? Uh, 27 going on 28. Oh, man. So it's been a little while. So you can, can yeah. you kind of tell people um, before we met, what was your life story? Oh, uh, it was extremely awkward. Didn't know how to talk to anybody <laughs> and not much has changed. But for the most part, I, I'd say that my life's always been about finding really cool new opportunities. And just like ever since I was a kid, I was always one of those people that just like wanted to live exactly the way I wanted to live if that makes sense so ever since I was a kid I was like I think like I was very stubborn there were a lot of things I didn't want to do and I made a big deal about like not wanting to do them and that just kind of carried over into my teenage and then adult life uh when I was you know younger I was really into theater and drama and arts and all that stuff going into university I started my first business at 19 uh it was a comedy production company or a stand-up comedy production company which ended up growing to like one of the best shows one of the most popular weekly shows in all of Ontario, which is the place where Toronto is for, for all the Americans listening. Um, So it was a big show packed house every night. That was my first business. It taught me a lot, but very quickly I realized that stand-up comedy was not where I wanted to be. The the money's not there. Everyone is toxic. There's a lot of substance abuse and there's a ton of ego management and it's not what I wanted to do with my life. So I ended up getting out of that, decided, Actually, my dad got me into this. He, he decided, or he, he showed me the world of like making money online. And I kind of took to that and experimented with a whole bunch of different business opportunities until I eventually found copywriting. And that's kind of where I built my career for the most part. Yeah, I ask about, like, I like to go back to your childhood because people that start young, as you did as entrepreneurs, tend to have that rebellious attitude. I know I had that. They don't want anybody telling them what to do. Um, so I, I just wanted to make sure that that was you because, you know, I, we've talked a lot about your early career just through our conversations, but not so much about your childhood. So I wanted to get that out there because I had the suspicion that that was going to be your answer. Yeah, I mean, we, we've had like a few conversations about my childhood, but we don't need to bring those up here. <laughs> all, all of the trauma. So uh, tell me about your first copywriting experiences. Like, how did you learn copywriting, first of all? Because that seems to be a big question that people ask me is like, what did you do to learn? What did you do to learn? And no matter how many books and courses I tell them. Uh, they're always asking more. They want more. So what, what did you do to get good at copywriting? And then how did you get your first client? So, I mean, I, I got good at copywriting just from writing ads for my, to promote my business uh, when I was writing, when I was running the comedy show, right? Like every, you learn very quickly that like there's two types of ads you can run in a very local community. It's either, Hey, here's the same poster with the information. You just run that until everyone's seen it a million times and they eventually come to your show or you run a different ad every week featuring the headliner and what they've done, or you run clips of what the headliner or another featured comic's done on a different stage. Like for example, um, I had one guy who was on Conan a few weeks before he headlined my show. So, so you know I'm posting the videos of him on Conan and being like, look, this guy's coming here. He's doing a 30 minute set, come, it's a free show. Um, so I was doing stuff like that. And you know, you just kind of learn what people want. Like you look at engagement stats and you go, oh, okay, people are really engaging with this sort of concept and this messaging. And then you just kind of tailor it from there. So that was kind of my foray into copy. This was before I knew what copywriting was. It was just like, oh, I need to write stuff on the ad so it does better. And then, you know, then I was like, oh wait, people will pay me to do this. This is fun. I want to do more of that. Like that's, that's kind of what it came down to. Um, I, I had experimented with a lot of different businesses. I've done everything. Like I, I had a drop shipping store. I had uh, some other e-commerce stuff. Like I did print on demand. Um, like I, I tried running an agency for a bit, lead, local lead generation, like literally everything under the sun you can imagine I did. Like even like arbitraging graphic design where like I, you know, I'd get a client for like 
who'd want a logo and they pay like a hundred bucks and I'd go on Fiverr and get someone to build it for five bucks and just like arbitrage the difference. So like, I always have these like little ways of making money online, largely because I hated going into an office and like, also I was extremely awkward and kept getting fired from jobs. So I knew that was not going to be the, the way, um, that was not going to be a career I could like do because every time I opened my mouth, I ended up in like the office with HR. So, um, I'm the life like, of a comedian. <laughs> fortunately, I, I still have not fully um, like stamped that out of me, um, no matter how many years of therapy. But I just found like the right group of misfits who just like mostly ignore the things I say, which is like the best way to approach that. Um, but anyway, uh, I I had done all these different things, and then I finally just made a decision. I was like, look, I'm, I'm going to keep experimenting with stuff where I have to commit to one thing. So I joined a mentorship program that was all about local lead generation and starting an agency. I was like, look, I don't need to do this forever. I was just like, I need a mentor to show me one path to making enough money that I don't keep experimenting with stuff so that I'm not like having to work like to bartend four nights a week just because I need money. I need one thing to make money and then I can figure out what I want to do. And through that process, one, I started making money more consistently. Uh, the agency was growing. That was great. I didn't like any of that, but it was like, okay, there's money here. Now I have the freedom to think and explore. And he, he had mentioned something about writing copy. And I was like, what's that? And I started looking into it and I was like, wait, this is actually what I want to do because ever since I was a kid, like there were two things I was really good at sales and writing, which um, like I'd been in sales since I was 15. Like that's what I did for work my entire life. Like my first job was going door to door, uh, selling like lawn care stuff. So like aeration, which is really put those like holes in your grass in the, in the springtime. And then in the summer, I'd literally push a one ton cart full of tar and like, you know, 50 and I'm like scrawny and like my voice is cracking. I'm like, can I spray your driveway? Like, but that was what I did. And I had to learn how to like create authority and confidence as a 15 year old pushing a cart that weighed 10 times as much as I did. Um, and so I liked sales. I always had, um, I always enjoyed that process, but sales is hard because it's always one-to-one. -one. It doesn't really scale the same way. And I was like, wait, so I can write stuff. I don't have to like go out and about and just by writing, I can still sell stuff. This is cool. And I only have to write the thing once and I can sell it to a thousand, 10,000, a million people. And that's kind of was like, okay. So then all of these different parts of my life, my history, all of that stuff kind of came together. And I was like, okay, this seems like the logical next step. And that's kind of how I got into copywriting. Yeah. I, the through pattern I see in your life is that you always kind of let the market teach you what to do next. So you learned copy basically by putting copy out there in the market and experimenting. You learned sales by failing over and over. And I think a lot of people that want to get into the online business, make money online, kind of have that free life that, you know, they see me and you living as we live where we want. You're in Colorado Springs, by the way, for uh, people that want to stalk him. <laughs> um, but they see this life and they're like, I want that. But then they take a course and they're like, well, I'm not ready yet. I'm not good enough yet. But the only way you get good enough is going out there into the market and putting stuff out and seeing what works. So you've kind of done that consistently through your life. Yeah. I mean, I think that's the problem with, I mean, th there's two different types of people that get into copy, right? Like there's the types of people who are just like, I'm great. Look at what I can do. And then there's the people who are like, I want to do this, but I'm too scared to like fail. And I think the problem with like, so you've got like the, you, you call it like, there's two archetypes, right? Like there's the arrogant copywriter and then these, there's the neurotic copywriter. And the neurotic copywriter is always the one that's like, oh, I don't want anyone to see this. You know, I'm getting paid 300 whole dollars to write this 40 minute VSL. It must be perfect. I must spend 18 months on this. And then there's like the, me, the arrogant copywriter who was like 300 bucks. I'll do this in 20 minutes. Here you go. Now my price is a thousand next time you want one. And so... <laughs> That, that's actually kind of how I started raising my prices. I was like, okay. Um, like I, I was very much like, I took the Dan Kennedy approach of like, your price is whatever you can say with a straight face. And then that price just, the, the number just kept getting higher. Yeah. And, there, there, be, there comes a certain point where they just, when you get too many no's that your price has to come back down. But yeah. that's like the beauty of letting the market decide is if exactly the, the first time you can scam somebody, you can never scam somebody. If you're coming back, they, they know what you're worth at that point. Um, I mean, I wouldn't say it as I was scamming people because I still like delivered a product. No, no, that's what I'm saying. Because you had return clients, it wasn't a scam. Mm -hmm. There's there's a lot of people out there right now that are selling um, basically how to get clients for copywriters, but they're not teaching the copywriters how to write. So these uh, these copywriters are going out there 
and they're getting like seven thousand, ten thousand dollars for their first sales letter uh, because the uh, the person running the program and I don't want to name names uh, this publicly, but the, he he'll brag about how he's trained them, but all he's really trained them to do is to get the client. And so this person's ruining his reputation, uh, and these copywriters they're never going to make it in the world. They have such a bad reputation already that they're going to they're burnt this early. Yeah, I mean, like if if, if you're going to burn the turf, then like you better be willing to leave the industry because it's a small industry. And here's the thing. Being a fly-by-nighter in the online space is very different from being a fly-by-nighter in a city. If you're a fly-by-nighter contractor, you can get a new wrap for your van and go to another town. If you're a fly-by-nighter copywriter, like everyone knows who you are very quickly because it's such a small industry. Yeah, I think, you know, it's been, I've been talking to a lot of businesses since I kind of left the money map world uh, that don't have any idea what copy is, but they're, they're writing copy for themselves. I think copy 101 is a, an essential element to any business. And most people kind of learn it through osmosis or, you know, the market tells them <laughs> the sales page isn't working. So they iterate and iterate and they never even think to hire a copywriter, but there's, there's so many different businesses out there. And while I said copy 101 is kind of essential for everybody, there's a lot of different way, people that don't necessarily want to write just copy. They want to run a business or do online ads or SEO or something. And you've had a lot of experience. So can we, um, I don't know, do you have a top couple other industries or other ways to, to get started online that's not just pure copywriting? Like, what would you recommend to people? I, I honestly would recommend just starting with something and just like, this, this can sound like such stupid advice, but like, just find something that makes money and then either figure out if you can make more money with it or find something that makes more money. So it could be as simple as like, um, like if, look, if you don't want to write, that's fine. There's so many more ways to make money online. Uh, e-commerce is a great one, like local retail arbitrage where you go to like Target, Walmart, TJ Maxx, and you use the Amazon seller app to scan products. And let's say you find like, like my wife did this for a bit. Uh, you find this like flat iron, like a, like a straightening iron for your hair. That's like $14 at TJ Maxx, but it's 80 bucks on Amazon. And then you just arbitrage that. So like, you know, you end up making like 12 to $15 after all the fees and stuff per thing. But like the point of that isn't to make a million dollars. It's not to build your fortune overnight. The point of that is just, Hey, I'm validated the concept that I'm able to make money outside of my job. I'm able to make money in ways that are non-conventional. And as soon as you do that, something changes in your brain. And once that switch has been flipped, it becomes significantly easier to make more money because all you need is proof of concept. The biggest thing that stops people is that first dollar. Once you make that first dollar, it gets easier, it gets easier. Yeah, I've heard that over and over from uh, copywriters, anybody that has an online business. It's that the first time they made a sale, it was just, it, it might've been 10 bucks, but it changed their perspective. It's like, oh, someone I don't know is probably half a country away, if not half a world away, just gave me money online. All I have to do is figure out how to do this over and over again. Yeah. Um, so you mentioned you had an agency. Uh, what was, what, what exactly did the agency do? Um, it was, so I specialized in helping mortgage brokers get leads. Okay. And it was, it was just through Facebook ads. So it was putting up an ad for, like, I just specialized in different areas. So it was like, uh, Toronto, uh, there were some spots out in Alberta, like Calgary, Edmonton, and then there were a few, I had like some clients in, I think Phoenix, um, and a few other spots in the U S. So there was, maybe, I think I had maybe like 10 to 15 at one point. And it was just, what was nice about that was like, the idea was, okay, you figure out the ad that works, figure out the landing page that works, you figure out the follow-up funnel that works, and then you just replicate it. And then they just pay every month. So a lot of people are doing, um, I like that model, by the way, that's pretty, it's, it's seems easy and smart and scalable. Yeah. Um, <laughs> the, the, that, yeah, was less than enthusiastic. I mean, I think like, I look back on that and I was like, if I just like put in a little bit more work, I'd probably still have those clients and they'd still be paying me. But like, we can probably talk about this later on, but I've made like some like poor business decisions and like the types of people I've chosen to partner up with. And that's come back to bite me. And unfortunately I like have a lot of trouble learning the lesson of who to trust. So like that kind of ended up not working out just because the person I partnered with ended up like stealing all the money and not fulfilling on the ads. And if I was just like, if I was just a little less lazy and had decided, okay, clearly he's a scammer and I should stop sending him his half of the money because he's not ever going to fulfill on these ads and just like figure out how to do it myself, I would have been fine. But instead I was like, Ooh, copywriting. And then I like went over there <laughs> and like, to be fair, that worked out pretty well. It did. Um, 
Yeah, there's, that's an interesting because I, I've considered a couple of times going into business with people. Actually, you and I had talked about uh, a business at one point that, yeah. um, that was going to be in real estate. And uh, given the current markets, I'm kind of glad that that fell through. <laughs> but um, yeah, it's, it's interesting because as soon as you get online and you start making a little bit of money, uh, you're going to get opportunities to partner with people. So because you've been burned now, like what, what qualities do you look for in a person that you might end up partnering with? I think it, it comes down to like the few things are like integrity and respect and communication are the big three. So like, here's the thing about like a skill set. A lot of people have a skill set. To me, that doesn't like that, that sounds harsh, especially because, you know, as copywriters, we always try to say like we're specialists and we're experts and all that. But at the end of the day, there's a lot of people with really good skill sets. What, what I care about more than anything is like, yeah, do we have complementary skill sets and can you do things that I can't? But two, or but like more important to me are the soft things. So like integrity, do you do, you do what you say you're going to do when, you're, when you say you're going to do it? That's big. If you say you're going to do something and then never do it, or say you're going to do it on a specific day and then that day comes and you pretend you never even heard about it, like that's a huge red flag for me because it tells me you have no integrity and you can't keep your word. Uh, respect is straight, like respect. Like, do you treat me um, how you wish to be treated? Or do you treat me like I'm worse than you? Um, do you treat, do you talk down to me? Do you, um, do you act like I don't exist? Like all of the things I've learned in businesses is like people say the right things to get you to do what they want, uh, they want you to do. And then as soon as you do it, they act like you don't exist anymore or you have no value to them. So to me, that's, that's respect. And then the third one is communication. One of my biggest pet peeves is like the type of person who messages you or calls you and expects an immediate response. But whenever you call or message them, they're never available. Like getting left on red, just being like ignored for having your messages ignored for weeks. Like to me, that's really big. So those three things matter to me more than anything else, because I know that if I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to show up and do it. I know that I treat people this is probably because like my mom has a lot of intergenerational trauma, but like I kind of learned to treat people better than me and like put most people on a pedestal, which is not healthy, but like I, I know what I treat people as. Like when I come to the table, I treat you with a lot of respect. So I expect the same in return. And then the third thing is communication. Like I think you know more than anything. Actually, we know this because whenever you would ignore people at Money Map, they'd call me and be like, hey, have you heard from Henry? And it's because I was always like immediately able to pick up the phone and be like, yes, I, I can get him for you. Because I, I know how important it is to be available. And like, yes, there, there, there are certain times where you have to separate yourself from the everyday chatter and the notifications in order to get shit done. But by and large, like if you need something from me, I'm there right now. And so I expect that from other people as well. So those yeah, are it, the things. It actually, it reminds me a lot. Uh, it, those are a lot of the qualities that you look for when you're, you're hiring somebody too. So <laughs> when I first met you, I think I was speaking at a, a copy chief event um, and it was, I think Abby Woodcock comes up to me and says, Henry, have you met menopause boy? <laughs> so I had just written a promotion that was, uh, it's a weight loss promotion based around menopause and it was really taking off. And I had done a lot of research on menopause and she's like, yeah, you, you got to come meet menopause boy. And that's when she introduced me to you. So you had also just worked on a promotion around menopause. And I asked you like, you know, cause I had just gone through it. What, how did you understand the market? How did you get into it? Uh, do you want to tell people what you did? Yeah. Uh, I don't know if I'm like extremely proud of this or should not be at all, but I made a fake Reddit account and went on r slash menopause and just pretended to be like a woman approaching. So like around like 35 ish, um, like just approaching like the premenopausal area and just started asking people questions like, Hey, I read this thing about like the, the product that I was doing was like around, like it was entirely like a uh, keto diet and like weightlifting based for how to like eliminate most of the symptoms of menopause. So it was like, hey, I've been reading this stuff about like how keto helps with some of the symptoms of menopause and how like weightlifting versus, and just like asking all these questions and like also asking about the symptoms and like what people were feeling and just essentially catfishing people for information on like what they've gone through. And so it went from like, you know, you got people at, at like around 30 who are also like just kind of trying to figure out what to expect. And then you have people in like their seventies who figured out how to turn on a computer and are answering these questions. I mean, I've seen some interesting things. Like I, I remember... I remember one specifically was like a lady being like, I have no sex drive at all help. I, I feel bad for my husband. I want to tell him to divorce me because I just can't get the, the motivation to have sex. And like, 
some like very clearly bitter old lady was just like, lube up, honey, he needs it, was the response. <laughs> yeah, I, when I was interviewing those women, one of the, the we were asking what the, some, some of the symptoms they were most frustrated by was. And this woman, uh, she's probably 60, and she goes, I'm so dry down there, my husband needs a crowbar to open me up. <laughs> They have no, I mean, older women will just tell you how it is. But so the reason I like that is because I don't think there's anything um, unethical about, especially on Reddit, an anonymous board uh, asking questions that actually maybe some women wanted to ask, but didn't, wouldn't form the question or were too nervous to. So Mm -hmm. I I don't see anything unethical that. And I thought it was a really innovative way to approach research. So as you know, one of the biggest things I advocate for is doing a ton of research to really understand the audience and the best message you can give to them. And so that's when I was like, yeah, I'm giving this kid a shot. And then you did all three things that you said you look for in other people. You, you were respectful. You did what you said you were going to do in our first couple of test projects. And you maybe over communicated, but you communicated plenty well. So that's that's how oh, you first sorry. got in with me. Sorry, say that again? That's, that's how you first got in with me. And uh, it has been, I think, a fairly fruitful relationship since then. Yeah, I mean, I, I would say so. It's, I mean, it went from me being your... What, what, what was the term we, we came up with for my role? Was it copy bitch? It was copy bitch. Okay, so I went from me being your copy bitch to you being the best man at my wedding. So so clearly a very fruitful relationship. <laughs> yeah, I want to get into some other ideas for businesses for people to start. I'm trying to think, especially a lot of older people worry that they're not going to make it as a copywriter because they, they haven't had the, you know, they have all these other life skills. Maybe they've been an engineer for 35 years but they want to transition out of that because the corporate life is just soul sucking. So are there businesses that you think work better for people that have like more life experience? Is it with teaching engineering, like starting a coaching site? I'm just trying to think of different things people could do online. I mean, it could be, but like you'd probably have to break down whatever person's life experiences into their constituent parts and just figure out the parts of them they like. Right. Cause at the end of the day, that's, that's usually how people decide what to pivot into. It's, it's, I'm very good at these eight things. I only like three of these eight things and I happen to be, and like the, you know, the Ikigai or the Venn diagram is like, I'm really good at this one thing that I really like. And the other two I'm, I like, but I'm like, you know, if you have, if you have a talent stack, this is something you've been talking about for a while, right? You've got eight things you're good at that you've done for 35 years. Three of them, you know, they might rank as like, I'm, in terms of priority, like this is the number one thing I'm good at and it's the number one thing I like. And then the other two things you like, you might be like seven and eight on the list. You have to figure out kind of like where that cross section is and like focus on that. So if you're an engineer and you're like, I hate bureaucracy, I hate people, I hate like the corporate hierarchy, HR policy bullshit, but I'm really good at systems, then probably SEO is is your, your bag. SEO is all about systems, strategy, planning. It's figuring out the exact um, process of how to build a website so that it scales depending on like what, what your um, purpose is. Like if you're trying to build a national affiliate site or you're trying to do SEO for clients, like all of that depends, right? And then it's all about systems because if you're doing client work, then you need people under you and they need to have roles and SOPs. And like engineers tend to be really good at that because they just kind of understand how systems and processes work. But if you're like, I don't know, you spent 30 years as like a broke actor and you're just sick of working in restaurants six nights a week. Um, maybe maybe you switch to being a phone closer because you like talking to people. You just hate being on your feet. And like, you know, 30 years in the restaurant industry, like you're going to have joint pain. So maybe you just want to be at home and being a phone closer is what you want to do. I mean, I ir- closing makes a lot of money. Ironically, I think um, copywriting is a great thing, a great career path for actors because they know how to, produce drama. So they might, you know, they've read enough scripts, they know what they know how to act it out. And I think, you know, one of the things that I talk about when you're when you're reading a sales letter, like, so you write the whole sales letter before it goes out, you really want to perform it because mostly they're being video recorded. Um, And you can feel when you're reading it. So you don't read it is the lesson is you act it out. So Mm -hmm. it really shows you where the drama is and where you need to add drama and what places get stale. You know, I was thinking when you were talking about you know, engineers, I think people with systems oriented minds would do well in media buying as well, which mm-hmm. is somewhere you can really scale. Absolutely. Especially if you're data driven, it, it becomes even more important. Like if you're, if you're an engineer, just because, you know, you were always good at conceptualizing things, but you hated data, probably not for you. But if you really like the data part of it, then like 
the thing about making most money online is it's all data driven. So <laughs> having that skill set helps a lot. Um, and it typically allows you to be more your own boss than stuff that's a little bit more like uh, trading your time for money, but you get to live wherever you want. I think another thing that people worry about in, in going into business for themselves in, in an online business is getting and managing clients. So have you developed strategies for that uh, over the years? Yeah. So, I mean, I... One of the things I took pride in as a freelancer before, you know, I came to Money Map and sold my soul to, <laughs> to the Agoraverse was I really took pride in the fact that I never had to prospect. Uh, I did all of it uh, through content marketing. So I found specific online Facebook groups where my ideal client was, and I just taught copy. And it was basically, hey, I heard, you know, David Garfinkel talk about this on a podcast. I like it. So I did a little bit more research and then, you know, reframed the content with my own words and my own lessons and my takeaways from it. And I would just post that in these groups. And the good news about that was like, one, I was internalizing the lessons, which made my understanding of the copy stronger, but two, it positioned me as an expert at the same time. And so all of my clientele was inbound. I mean, inbound clients are by far the best. Yeah. Uh, my strategy to give high prices. <laughs> Absolutely. Uh, and then client management is the other side of that coin is so once you have a client, it's, you don't want to lose them <laughs> yeah. until you have to, you know, sometimes you price out of a client, but mm -hmm. for the most part, you have to manage the client. Uh, so did you, do you, how did you approach managing a client? How did you manage me? Oh, I mean, like, I mean, if we're going to be serious, I didn't want the job because I knew I wasn't getting paid as much as I was making as a freelancer. Um, but I, I approached that as like a relationship. Like, again, like, I sound like an asshole, but like, I, I didn't go to Coffee Chief to get a job like most of the people who were there. I, I literally went to make friends because I was like, I'm working online by myself and I'm like too extroverted to like be in a hole. Like I need to make friends. Maybe copywriters will be good friends because this is what I do. And turns out like, oh, most copywriters enjoy being in the hole. Never mind, this was a bad decision. But I, I went to that event specifically to make friends. And like, it's so cheesy to be like, just go to build relationships. But that's what I went to do. And, you know, this opportunity fell in my lap and, you know, we we pursued it and never looked back. But in terms of managing clients, like it comes down to those three things I said, the key core values, like uh, communication, integrity, and respect. Every client I ever took on, I made very clear, here's what the timeline's going to look like. Here's how quickly you can expect to get a response from me for anything. And like, you know, I'm not gonna take your money and run. So like that's integrity, communication, respect. Yeah, uh, I always think down to that for management, and that's why I still have clients who I worked with years ago still messaging me, being like, "Hey, can you write this thing for me?" Um, there's a Neil Gaiman speech that he gave in, I don't know, several years ago. Now he was it was a commencement speech he gave at the University of the Arts in Philadelphia, uh, and most artists go on to be freelancers of, of some type or another. And and he made the point that there's only three things you need to keep your clients happy: is you have to be good at what you do. You have to uh, be a pleasant, a pleasure to work with, and you have to turn the work in on time. And he says, <clears throat> two out of three is fine. You know, if if you're good and you turn the work in on time, they're going to put up with you being a jerk. If you're, you know, your work isn't the best, but you're you're pleasant and you always get in on time, they're still going to hire you. So it goes on like that. I, and I thought that was really funny, but also true advice. And I love Neil Gaiman as an author. Um, so. You know, I had a little bit of a different approach to getting clients when I was still looking for clients. Uh, I mostly got my clients at live events, like conferences and stuff. Um, but you, there's a certain, I, I sent an email out about this earlier this week. There's a certain approach you have to do it. A lot of people go to these conferences. And actually, this is kind of, you had the same attitude as me, but people go to these conferences and they look like total newbies and they're there to learn and beg for a job. And nobody wants to hire somebody that's begging for a job. So yeah. I always I always went to conferences with the idea that like I'm here to network. Um, I might learn something cool from the speakers. Uh, I might find a client, but I'm just here to make contacts because the bigger your network is, the the more longer your career can be, honestly, and the more successful you can be because you have people to reach out to. Um, but I also talked about the uh, keeping the client in your frame. So I mean the the online like men's dating niche uses frame a lot. You got to mm -hmm. keep a woman in your frame. But it's, it's, true, it's more true in sales than it is in dating even. Uh -huh. uh, if if you, know, you go up to a prospect and you're like, oh, hey, I have this product. Uh, you know, how would it fit in your life? 
you're trying to enter their frame. You're trying to enter their view of the world. If you come in and was like, well, look, here's what I got. Um, I'm the authority in this. There, I know I can help you. That kind of brings them, they're either going to enter your frame or not. I talked about one of the things that Jed and I did early on is the, the binder full of ideas. And I think this is, a, it's just brilliant. Um, we Sorry, do. I keep nodding, but I realize that like it's in speaker mode so people can only see you. And also this is a podcast and so people can't hear me, but I'm agreeing with everything you're saying. Of course you are. I'm the authority here. You're in my frame. I am in your frame entirely. Because <laughs> I have like, been the past four years at this point. But like quite literally on my screen, you're yes, in the frame. I am in your frame. Uh, <laughs> no, but so Jed and I would, would create this binder full of different ideas for promotions. And these were really well-researched, kind of interesting hooks for promotions. And so we just go up to clients that are at when, you know, they'd ask what we do, uh, you know, we're copywriters. Um, you know, Jed had already done Aftershock at that point, which was after, right? yeah, over a hundred million after the end of America, it was the biggest promotion like that had ever been sent out in the past decade or so. So he already had the reputation. Uh, I was still, you know, kind of his protege at that point, but yes, we present, yeah, it, I really was. Our first call was 13 hours on Skype where we were just reviewing copy and, I didn't have the option to be like, I could quit, but I wasn't going to quit with the best copywriter in the world at the time. So I, I stuck in there. Yeah. Uh, but, but yeah, you go up to client, a potential client with just a binder full of different ideas for promotions you could write for them. And they're seeing not just the one that they, they pick or the one that you show them. They're seeing like, oh, this is an idea machine. And people always want to work with copywriters that are idea machines. There's just not enough good ideas and copy to go around for these big publishers. Yeah, I mean, I, I just, it's funny you say that. Like, one of the things that like I've been really like thinking about over the past little while, it also comes from like one of the things you said, which was that your greatest failure in life or your greatest realization is that you've never had an original idea in your entire life. Your greatest goal is to have one. I, I think the problem with, and actually, this isn't a problem. It's just there's there's different types of personalities, right? And one of the things that really drew me to Money Map and that world was the continuous um prioritization of new ideas and new big ideas there's a lot of ways to make money in this world copying and you know i just got out of like a business relationship where it wasn't working out because the other person involved didn't actually care about testing anything new or trying anything new all they wanted to do was copy what was working in the marketplace no matter how many times i said once people have seen copy in the marketplace 90 percent of the people who will buy that same idea from you are gone because it's the same idea and like my philosophy on like marketing is a great idea generated poorly or executed poorly does better than a poor idea executed well. And so just the idea of like orig originality being so important in marketing, in life, in just general success is so important. And people don't really prioritize that because we often think what's working, I'll just do that. But, but that's not how that's that's just a straight shot to the middle like it, it's the quickest way to being the middle of the pack which is fine if that's what you want to do but if you want to be if you want to get ahead if you want to be the best if you want to innovate you, you can't think what's working it's, the question you ask is what's not working or what has people what have people never heard of before and like you know that's something you taught me that's something jed taught me very similar like so i, I can totally understand why just going back to what you were saying is like i can totally understand why people saw what Jed was doing, which is an original idea. I've never seen it. Like, and you've talked about this before, so I know it's a thing, but like, I've never ever seen anyone else at a conference go up to people and be like, hey, I have a binder full of ideas. They're either, hey, you want to see my samples or hi, can I have a job? No, it's amazing. We've actually been talking about this. We both spoke, Jed and I both spoke at a Clayton Makepeace conference in 2014. And, and he talked about the binder idea and everybody came up to us and said, that's just brilliant. That's I'm, I'm definitely going to do this. But then they start uh, realizing how hard it is to come up with good ideas. <laughs> they, they don't want to do the research. They'll read for you know an hour and be like, well, I haven't found anything good. I'm going to give up. And there's a certain tenacity I think you have to have, a certain desire to want to put in the work to get good at copywriting. It's, you actually got started getting well-paid fairly early in your career. Um, I, I, you know, my first six-figure year was 25. You were, I think, a couple years earlier than that. Yeah, I want to say my first six-figure year would have been, I think it was, it was probably, yeah, 23, 24. So what kind of motivation did you have? Because that takes, you know, I know from my own experience, that just takes so much freaking work that you have to put in like 14-hour days, six days a week and when you're that young, because nobody trusts somebody that's that young. 
So what you just have that time when you're that young, right? Like I was 23, 24 at the time I was, I had no expenses. Like I had a car that I paid off with my, uh, with the money I made for my comedy business. So I, I didn't have a car payment. Um, I had just moved back in with my, uh, mom from university. So I didn't have rent. Um, I made once I, I think once I had my first $10,000 a month, I was like, okay, I can stop working in the basement. And I paid 200 a month for a co-working space. So that was my expense. And then like a hundred bucks a month for insurance for my car. So like, I had no relationships, um, but yeah, I had like some friendships, but like at that point, my priority was like making money and building my career. So it wasn't like, like I was never the type of person. And this, this might come from the fact that like in high school, no one invited me to shit. So I was just like, I got over the FOMO by the time I was like 20. And then like, I got blackout drunk too many times in university that I no longer liked going out for drinks. Um, so like none of that was temptation for me. Like I was like, no, nah, I'd rather just work. Like, I just enjoyed the work. I enjoyed the hustle. I enjoyed the process. And it wasn't like I was like, you know, posting every day on Instagram about how hard I was working. I just, I just actually just enjoyed the process because I liked seeing my bank account grow and grow and grow. And when you don't have responsibilities, it's a lot easier. Yeah, I agree that. So the advantage of being young when you start your business is that you have the time to put it, put into it. Mm -hmm. The advantage of being older is that you have life experience that you can actually bring to people. It's very hard to get people to take you seriously when you're 23, 24, 25. I mean, I, you've had that experience. I'm sure I had the experience, um, but you have to push through. I think, I think my motivation for pushing through was like, first of all, I said I was going to do it and I was too embarrassed to not, like I had a couple good months when I first started copywriting and then I was like, screw it. I'm quitting my job. I'm doing this copywriting thing. And then those clients lasted for like six months. And then it was like three months before I got another one. So yeah, there was a, a little bit of a, a downturn there when I was 23. Um, but my motivation was like, you know, I grew up broke uh, in an inner city. I, I wanted to, I think it was really proving to myself that I was worth something, that I had value. Like I've always viewed myself as like smart, but you know, I know a lot of smart people that are way smarter than me that are dead broke. Mm -hmm. There's, I think there's some intrinsic motivation that I wish I could sell to people because if we could sell this motivation to people, a lot more people will be successful. So do, do you have some like similar feeling of, of trying to prove yourself? Like what, what do you think your motivation was? Oh, now we get into the childhood trauma. Okay. Um, so when I was a kid, like my parents had a lot of money for the first like eight years of my life. Like my dad had a successful business. My mom had like a, you know, a stable government job back when like, you know, a government job was a good thing. Um, so like they, they make really good money. We live in a big house, like, you know, very, very, you know, privileged childhood. And then like around, oh, I was, I think it was right. It was, there was like this combination of things that happened. So my dad owned a high-end cigar store. Um, and a lot of things happened, right? Like between 9-11 and the SARS fiasco that started in 2002 and went to about 2004, that completely destroyed the tobacco market between import export problems, uh, demand. So his, his business went from making like, like printing money to like nothing. And so we lost a lot. And then, you know, they had to sell the house. We, we actually moved from Toronto to Vancouver just to get a fresh start. Um, we, were, we went from living in a big house to living in a basement. Like, so I saw like both sides of it. And, you know, one of the things I learned as a kid was just like, I don't want that position. Like I, I want to do something that creates value. And one of the things that I really didn't want was overhead because I saw like what happened when you have to like my, my dad's store was beautiful. He had really expensive inventory and it was in one of the most um, like sought after commercial districts in downtown Toronto. Like his rent was through the roof. Like maintenance of that property was through the roof. Like labor, like staff costs, inventory. It was all so much. So like I knew one of the things that like motivated me was I want to make a lot of money and have zero expenses. And, you know, for tax purposes, that's not the best. Because now I have to call my accountant and be like, hey, what can I call an expense? Because I operated a 97% profit margin. But on the opposite side, I know that the money that comes in is mostly mine. It's not going to 18 different sources. And so that was one of the things that made, made it for me. It was like, I want to make as much money as possible and put as much money away as possible. Uh, I mean, I'm sure there's like other stuff in there. Like, you know, as a, as a young man, you always want to like outdo your father. So like, I'm sure there was some of that there where I was just like, I want to make more money in my you know, year than my dad's seen in his entire life. And that was probably part of it and hadn't fully worked through that, but I'm sure that played in. And then, you know, I saw my, like my parents got divorced when I was in high school and I saw my mom struggle a lot. 
So another thing that motivated me was like, you know, I want to pay off my mom's house. So it was like a bunch of different things that kind of like all kind of pieced together into what I ended up making my career. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, I know most of the, the good copywriters I know had some sort of like childhood trauma or, or some sort of like they, they didn't come for much and they just wanted to make it because it is a very scrappy industry. That's actually what I love about the online world is it's you have to have a certain amount of intelligence and a certain amount of like know-how, but then the scrappy people just win. Scrappy people are the ones that make the most money. And so, I, I mean, I just love that aspect of it. Yeah. So and I, I will say just, sorry, I don't want to like just bulldoze you, but like going back to like what you said earlier about how like, yeah, I, I, I was fortunate in that I made a lot of money early on in my copywriting career. Part of that is honestly, it's because someone took a chance on me and gave me a foundation which allowed me to take more risks. And that was my first full-time copywriting client. Uh, and like, we don't need to get into like the full details, but like Anne hired me probably after I'd done like two or three projects. So I was very new and was like, basically like hoping my beautiful personality would get me this job, which was a, like a full-time copy position. But like, think about like being full-time inside like uh, that type of company, which was like remote and it was a course, like there wasn't a lot to do. So there were like, yeah, there were, maybe three days a week where I was like, okay, I got to really hustle. And then I had all this spare time. So I was like, okay, let me just build up a client base from there. So I always make sure that anything I need, I said this to all my clients too, like I have this position, she's priority, everything else goes on top of that. So I always make sure that work got done. And like, she paid me a pretty good base for like the amount of work I was doing. So that was fine. That was, that was more than, that was like basically halfway to six figures already. So then the other half was just like a couple of clients a month with all we needed. And again, so because you, I had like a pipeline, it was very easy to fill those spots. Do you still, uh, do you still, I know money map is a big client of yours still, and you're, you're doing some interesting things over there. Mm -hmm. Um, but do you still take on any, uh, side clients, consulting, stuff like that? So, so the correct answer is no, because I'm, I'm more interested right now. So I, I, I just took a break from being in an organization where I was working 12 to 16 hour days, like seven days a week. And again, like I wasn't being respected. There was no communication. There was no integrity. So I got really burnt out of that. So moving back to money map was like, you're going to get the majority of my focus and the rest of the time is going to be for myself, my relationship. Uh, like, I'm like I'm newly married. We've been married for just like a year and a half. And like that first year and a half, all I did was work. So I really wanted to spend, I want to spend more time with my wife and building that relationship. That said, I like cool stuff. So if anyone has a cool project or proposition, I'm always open to hear about it. But for the most part, like at this point, I'm really happy with just um, spending, you know, my, like the time I'm selling, giving it to Money Map, and then the rest of my time focusing on myself and my relationship and just kind of figuring out what I want out of life. Because for the most part, I, I don't know. I, I thought I knew what I wanted out of life when I was 23. And then I spent seven years working and haven't actually asked myself that question again. <laughs> Yeah, that's, I actually went down the same thing. It's like, oh, I just want to be the best copywriter in the world. Um, that was my motivation. Then I, you know, 31, I'm a millionaire and I'm looking around. I was like, do I want to be better than Jed? Do I want to like really put in the hours it takes or do I want to just keep making a good living? And that's kind of, and you know, then COVID hit and rocked my whole freaking perspective on things, which is why I'm doing the podcast and, and more consulting now. Um, but if anybody does have that interesting type of project, where, where can they reach out to you? Oh, I mean, the easiest way is probably just like find me on Facebook or hit me at Sohail at LivelyWealth.com. Don't actually go to LivelyWealth.com. That site hasn't been like active in seven years at this point. I just owned the domain and had built like everything through that email address. So I just kept the domain. Um, don't go to the website. Just email me at Sohail at LivelyWealth.com if you're interested in anything. Uh, and that's S-O-H-A-I-L. At Lively, L-I-V-E-L-Y, wealth as in money.com. I just want to make sure people could spell it. Well, so hell, this has been a lot of fun. Um, I really appreciate you even uh, blackmailing me, I guess, into getting on the podcast. I mean, you didn't have to put my question on the Q&A. No, I, I think this was good. I, I wanted to get you on because I wanted people to see kind of somebody that, like I said, is, is scrappy and made their way up and now is, you know, doing great things, making a, a good amount of money. And you still have, you know, the, the you're getting out of the machine part is like, you get to, to work hard when you're working, but then have plenty of time to spend with your family. So I, yeah, I, I mean, I, I think that's exactly what it is. It's just figure out what you want and then figure out how to, how to make it happen. And sometimes, sometimes the goals and the ambition is it's nice, 
And then, you know, when the real world hits, you just, your priorities change, right? When you're young and single, you're like, I want to take over the world. And then, you know, five years of trying to take over the world. And you're like, actually, I just want a house that's paid off and people not breathing down my neck all the time. That seems so much better. It's like your whole approach to politics, right? How you, how you completely shifted on that from, from. Uh, yeah. My, I mean, my politics were, so when I was young, I was a libertarian, like in college, I was in the college libertarians. And then I saw what they did to Ron Paul in that 2008, 2007, 2008, where they just totally ignored him. And, and basically the, the establishment and the media pretended he wasn't there. So nobody found out about it. And so from there on, I was just like, I'm just going to be practical. I'm going to, you know, vote for what I think is the best. And then eventually just stop voting because it, it's ridiculous. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think your approach was like, was, was right in the sense more, more what I was thinking when I was alluding to that was what you said to me, which is like, anyone who gets into politics is insane. And it, and it makes sense, right? Like you don't go into politics because you want to make a change. You go into politics because you want power. It's the same thing when you're young and 23 and you're like, I want to rule the world. And then you like start getting responsibilities and realizing how terrible this would be if you, you know, like, I can't imagine being like, I say prime minister of Canada because I legally would never be allowed to run for president just because I'm Canadian and, you know, tentatively allowed in this country for the time being. <laughs> but like, I can't imagine that. Like the amount of people breathing down your neck, the amount of pressure, like, but like, I think, I think when you're young and idealistic, the real world doesn't, like you, you allow, you can either allow the world to happen to you or you can allow the world to teach you. And like, that's the difference between like having agency and controlling your life or having like just being a victim. And I think like a lot of people go through life where they, 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 they have a lot of nostalgia for the time when they were young and idealistic. I say this as I'm 27, so I'm still young and idealistic by most standards, but I've also been like beaten down by like the world. Um, when, when you're young and ideal, like you have this nostalgia for that, for that, that time in your life where you thought you could accomplish anything. And like people, you know, they, as they get older, they get bitter because they feel like they allowed the world to take that away from them. I think of it more as like the world is teaching me a lesson about myself and what I actually want. So I take a lot more agency and like taking these cues from life or as we said at the beginning of this episode from the, from the market and making my decisions based on new information that's coming. I think that's a beautiful idea to end on. So Sohail, thanks so much for coming on. Thanks, Henry.